If you told me that 2025 was going to bring a gaming blend of Legend of Dragoon and Super Mario RPG, I'd call you a lunatic. Yet here we are. My name is Tom, otherwise known as Titanium Legman, and welcome back to the channel. We are Expedition 33. Hello everyone, if you enjoy what I do, including my gaming news coverage for new upcoming titles like, say, Claire Obscura Expedition 33, which is a traditional JRPG, RPG style game, a little bit different from my normal turn-based strategy RPG, but still in the wheelhouse. If you like that type of content, then a like on this video and a subscription to the channel would be very much appreciated. Thank you so much. So what is Claire Obscura Expedition 33? Well, I've been wanting to make a video covering it ever since it was first revealed, but I wanted to wait until a little bit more information came out for me to work with before I did so. With the release of the most recent gameplay overview trailer, that time has come. So first, a refresher. And you can find links to both trailers for the game in the description as well if you want to go watch them in full, which I highly encourage that you do. They're very pretty. So, like I mentioned, this is a classic RPG, JRPG style game. It's going to be very familiar to anyone who grew up playing your Final Fantasies, your Legend of Dragoons, your Mario RPGs, you know, the classics. The story revolves around the painter, an eldritch being on an island who paints a new number counting down every year. When she does, everyone of that age is immediately erased from reality, and every year a new expedition named after the current number travels to the painter's island to try and kill her to end the cycle. How does any of that work? We have no idea. What are the implications of that? Well, seeing as how the number is counting down every year, it's not going to be too much longer before you have just literal children left and humanity dies. So, kind of need to go deal with that, you know? Now, the big selling point of the game, beyond its beautiful graphics and some of the voice talent that we'll talk about in a second, is the reactive style combat. This is a style of combat that a lot of people are equating to, like, turn-based RPG Souls-likes, which I refuse to allow that to be the way that we talk about this when Legend of Dragoon is right there and has been waiting for its acknowledgement for over 20 years, okay? This is a reactive combat style akin, again, to Legend of Dragoon and Super Mario RPG for both attacks and evasion slash pairings, meaning when you go into an attack, each hit of the attack is going to have a different timing that you need to hit at the right moment to get the maximum damage and potentially even continue the combo. If it's like how it was in Legend of Dragoon, if you screw up any of the inputs, the combo ends right where you messed up. So obviously you lose out on a lot of damage. If it's just akin to something like maybe uh, a Super Mario RPG, you could lose the combo. You might just deal less damage. Maybe there's the chance for an enemy to counterattack. Different possibilities in that way. This is also important, as I mentioned, for your defense, as you can evade and parry attacks as well. We don't know exactly yet what attacks can be evaded versus parried, but we'll talk about that in more depth later into the video. You, of course, have a blend of sword play, magic, gunplay, and engineering. These are all confirmed aspects of gameplay and party classes. You're seeing a bunch of that going on on screen right now. Notably, it's created by former Ubisoft devs with a rich gaming history. Like, we're talking some real classics. You can see here, this is the roster from their actual website, where they've listed off all their gaming influences, things that they've worked on in the past. And I gotta say, like, there's some pretty based stuff in here, man. That was all the buzz when this game was first revealed. This is the studio's first title, and people were looking at their studio history and being like, man, these are some people with some good taste. So it... Puts a good feeling in my chest that they know where they're coming from when it comes to making a good game. Obviously, as you can see, there's a beautiful art style with a blend of sort of realistic but stylized, very artistic, obviously. Great animations rooted deeply in French history and culture while also clearly having a lot of influence from anime and JRPGs and that flashiness, which is very fun. And it features some stellar voice talent with, at the very least, Ben Starr, Clive from Final Fantasy 16, and now a lot of other characters from a lot of other games, and Jennifer English, who any of my BG3 homies will know, Shadowheart, waifu for laifu, great voice actress, love to see her here, and I believe maybe that Ronnie's voice actress has a role in the game as well, Ronnie from Elden Ring, but I couldn't find concrete details on that, it was just kind of like hearsay, so take that with a grain of salt, but... That's the idea of Expedition 33, and it captured everyone's attention when it was first shown off a couple of months ago. But now, with the gameplay trailer, there's a ton for us to sink our teeth into, and that's going to be the bulk of the video here. This new trailer was just released and showcases some new environments, actual world exploration, and proper, not cut up for trailers, combat mechanics, as well as a boss fight. 
I'm going to break down all the important and interesting details that I was able to find here, adding notable context and insight where I can find it. And then if there's something that I don't mention, put it in the comments so that I can know so that I can look for it in the future as I continue my analysis of the game leading up to its release. First off, it's important to note that no expedition has ever returned from the quote-unquote continent, the name given to the Paintress's Island, and she's clearly still alive, so nobody has been successful on any of these expeditions. That hasn't stopped humanity from trying, his main character Gustav notes here that the, these calcified bodies that his party comes across belong to Expedition 68. Doesn't bode well for our party, but it does mean that there's going to be plenty of opportunities to come across remnants of humanity on our journey, which is cool. We then see a fight with a Nevron being supposedly created by the painter. Combat begins when our character and the creature meet with a clash that appears to be an attack from the player. I'm assuming this means that we can get an advantage for attacking first, a classic of this style of RPG, and this is supported by the battle starting with a quote-unquote first strike for the party, presumably from said attack. Once combat begins, there's a lot to take note of. First off, I have to take a look at the UI. We see Gustav has the ability to use items, skills, and attacks in a similar formation to that you know, we see in things like Persona 5 with a similar style. He also has the ability to aim using LT, which you might assume has to do with his ability to use guns. You'd be wrong. More on that in a bit. In the top left, we see the turn order for our party and the enemy. In the bottom right, we see our HP, what looks like a mana bar, but is actually an ability point meter based on some later information and a few other bits of relevant info. In the mid-right, we see a special call-out for Gustav's unique trait, his bionic arm. Now, someone with a form of bionic limb himself, this is a particularly exciting trait for him to have. The false arm allows him to build up a charge by parrying and dodging attacks as well as dealing damage, culminating in more damage for his overcharge ability. Speaking of which, in the next major screen, we see Gustav's abilities. They are as follows. Overcharge deals high lightning damage based on the charges of Gustav's arm, tying back to what we just discussed. Lumiere Assault deals low physical damage, but hits multiple times. You know, low damage, lots of hits, death of a thousand cuts, stack with crit, that type of thing. And hey, what a surprise, each crit in this attack generates more charge for the arm. Very nice. Finally, we have Marking Shot, which deals low lightning damage and marks the target. Note that we don't know exactly how Mark functions yet, but based on this red X symbol attached to it, I believe it's meant to set up combos similarly to games like Darkest Dungeon 2. We'll see with some of the other characters' abilities that they rely on there being a marked target, so that kind of makes sense. There's also the From Fire and Powerful notes, which we don't fully understand yet, but we'll see more about later on in the trailer. Attached to each of these, though, is an AP cost, tying back into the segmented bars each character has. When triggering Lumiere Assault, we see Gustav go into a combo, which is where our previously mentioned Legend of Dragoon influence comes in. The player needs to time a button press at the exact right moment for each hit to get the maximum possible damage, similar to the additions system for basic attacks in LOD. It's not clear, again, if failing the proper input breaks the combo like LOD, but it's still great to see here. It's not something that I've seen often enough in any RPG since that game came out way back on the PS1. Next up, we see Luna, resident mage of the party with her own skills and abilities, of course. Luna is by far the most mechanically complicated party member we've seen thus far, with a lot of combo potential in her kit. So buckle in and pay attention, there's a lot to go over here. She has a stain mechanic as her personal mechanic, where she gains elemental stains by casting spells, which she can use to quote-unquote unleash the mayhem, i.e. it enables her combos. She also has an aim skill like Gustav, implying that's a regularly utilized ability. Luna's spells are as follows. Healing Light, which, unsurprisingly, heals an ally. It can also use what looks like an earth healing stain to cost zero AP, while also generating both a fire and ice stain. If y'all are familiar with playing Black Mage in Final Fantasy XIV, by the way, this definitely reminds me of the rotating between fire and ice spills, throwing in a thunder spell to put on some damage over time, and then switching back, so you always have maxed out damage but never quite run out of mana. Similar vibes here with this. Speaking of which, the next skill, Immolation, deals fire damage, which applies a burn. And remember that mark effect we talked about with Gustav? Well, well, the red X that implies a mark shows back up here in this skill description, implying that using Immolation on a marked target applies to more stacks of burn, so you can get some nice damage over time there. Combine that with the ability to use an Ice Stain to deal more damage, and the fact that Immolation creates two Fire Stains, and I hope you can see where this is going with the major pop-off combo potential. Next, we have Earth Rising, which deals low Earth damage to all enemies, uses a Fire Stain to deal more damage, and adds two Earth Stains. Finally, there's Ice Lance and Thunderfall, which don't have any listed effects on this screen, but which add two of their respective elemental stains to Luna's bank. Moving from character to enemies, we see an example of an enemy attack. The Foe Luster performs a fast combo on Gustav, which the player has to repeatedly dodge. 
This is honestly one of my biggest questions about Expedition 33's gameplay. We can see that there's a dodge command and a parry command, but we don't really know when one is applicable over the other. If we can just dodge every attack, there'll be no challenge once the timing is mastered, so I can't imagine that's the case. I'm excited to see what the mechanics are here, if you really get punished, if you miss a dodge on an attack, or if you misread whether you need to use a dodge or a parry. We do get AP on parry, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, so maybe the implication is knowing when to just fully dodge and avoid all damage, as opposed to when you can afford to take some damage from parrying and get AP to use abilities. That'd be a cool interplay, but I need to see more about it before I really know for sure. Anyway, we next see the Luster unleashing a series of attacks on the entire party, which they parry, and then, as we we mentioned gain AP from. Obviously this is a huge bonus as they seem to take no damage here and get an ability resource, so th again there's got to be some sort of drawback we'll learn about. Immediately afterwards, and for reasons I don't quite understand, we could see Luna loses 2 AP and then Gustav counters with a hugely damaging shot from his gun, building up huge stagger on the enemy and ending the fight. It looks like this is a smooth transition from the party parrying the attack into Gustav countering, so I'm not sure why Luna would have lost AP here. Maybe she has some sort of innate ability that allows her to just automatically burn AP to boost an ally's counterattack? That could be cool. It would be very AP intensive when she's already trying to cast spells, but I mean, hey, maybe that's part of the shtick, so we'll have to see. We also do get to see a post-battle screen here, which I'm very happy about, as it does give us a good bit more info. We see that we get money, of course, as well as various crafting components, acknowledgement of what we killed, XP bonuses, and what looks like skill progression for both Gustav and Luna. I'm assuming that this is a leveling progression system where you get bonuses based on what you do in combat, hearkening all the way back to stuff like Final Fantasy II, funny enough, but we'll have to see. Now, I need to pause the discussion of mechanics and systems to just take a second to acknowledge how cool this game looks, man. Like, I don't care about the graphical fidelity for its own sake, style over graphics, but this world and its environments, how the characters fit into it, it feels like it has just the exact right mix of fantastical and realistically otherworldly that I love from good fantasy and sci-fi, right? Like you just walked into a storybook and you're imagining what everything looks like without being given that image, but then they, that image is plucked out of your head and put on the screen. That's the kind of feeling I get looking at this, and I love that. It's got that mythical, otherworldly, not standard pop culture fantasy that's become all the rage. It's got a little bit fancier stuff going on, a little bit more like a painting, which, you know, makes sense. As part of checking out this environment, we get a little bit of exploration with Mael, the younger sister of main character Gustav, and also the character who's voiced by Shadowheart, so there you go. She actually is able to use a grappling hook to traverse areas and find hidden items that do admittedly look rather simple and linear, but still cool, and this is implied to be a very early section of the game, so I imagine it could get more complicated with time. Also, Mael's actual run cycle and movement are kind of janky and stiff, with even like her ponytail juddering up and down like it's spring-loaded. It's a little... Eh, it's a minor graphical nitpick. It can be easily fixed, I'm sure. It says right there on the trailer, game still in development. So, like, I'm not too bothered by it, but it's just one thing that bugged both myself and Jane when we were first watching this trailer going through. Now, one notable section of this exploration, however, is this Pictor's versatile item that is picked up under a tree that grants restored health, speed, and after a free aim hit, base attack is increased by 50% for one turn. This is a nice little hint about possible consumables and what other things we might see, and it also gives us a little bit of insight into that aim ability that it seems like all of the characters have. I'm guessing this is maybe something that you can do as just a free attack. Maybe you don't use your turn, but you can only use it periodically. Because we've seen in the first trailer, Gustav takes a bunch of what seems to be free pistol shots on an enemy. So if you're able to do that after using this item and then increase your base attack for a turn by 50%, it could be a nice way to combo into doing more stuff on a turn, assuming that it doesn't eat your turn. We'll have to see. There's a lot of potential there, but I love to see consumables and have them kind of give an idea of things to come for the future. Finally, we see the boss fight that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. We get to see a perfect parry with the entire party, which triggers a party-wide counter, which is a lot of fun on its face. 
and we can even see that certain effects like burn and defense down are triggered by this attack, which could be vital in boss fights. Next, we see that party member Mael's unique trait is her stance system, giving her different buffs and debuffs depending on the fencer's stance she's currently in. We unfortunately don't get much info on her abilities, but we can see based on this screen that her skills get bonuses from marked targets and targeting burnt enemies, but also that they switch what stance she's in, implying a certain amount of duelist's finesse to her mechanics. Next, we get to see the skills of Gustav and Luna that were previously hidden. Gustav's From Fire deals medium damage and heals him if the target he hits is burning, which is pretty cool. And his powerful skill applies a buff of the same name to the party, increasing their damage and giving Gustav between zero to two charges for his hand. We also see Luna's other skills with Ice Lance dealing medium ice damage and slowing the enemy, while Thunderfall deals medium lightning damage to random enemies for two to six hits. This is potentially really big opportunities for boss damage, especially since crits trigger extra hits and it can use fire stains to increase its damage. If you can hit like six times on one enemy and just nuke a boss down, that could feel really powerful. And I mean, to me thus far, Luna looks like the coolest character. We'll have to see what the others are kind of able to do, but on its face, she's got the most energy. Now it's notable that there is a cut in the trailer here and then both the party and the boss have much less health than they previously did. I wish we knew what happened in that span. I'm sure they didn't want to show off the whole boss fight, but still, I do have some questions. Uh, regardless, we do see that Mael goes into a flurry of attacks, switching stances and inflicting break on the enemy boss, before finally, the final blow is struck. On the victory screen, the most notable feature is that the weapons Yevarum, 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 I'm going to say Yevarum, has leveled up, which is interesting indeed. I love when you can level your actual weapons as well in games like this really incentivize you to maybe stick to a couple of strong options. Finally, we get some interesting story implying a connection between Mael and the painter's creations, as well as the idea that they do actually have personalities and feelings of their own. Combined with the initial trailer for Expedition 33, I am convinced that there's an incredibly compelling RPG hurtling towards us, and given its clear inspiration from classics like Legend of Dragoon, Super Mario RPG, I couldn't possibly be more excited. Keep your eyes on this one as it's releasing at some point in 2025 on PS5, the modern Xbox series, and PC. I'll be sure to inform you all of any important info we learn. And with any luck, we're going to be having a grand old time in just a few short months. Probably going to be a few long months. I'm assuming this is coming out tail end of 2025, but we'll see. Who knows? Either way, let me know what your thoughts are on Expedition 33. Are you interested in it? Do you want to pick it up? Do you want to see more content from me about it? Let me know all that in the comments below. If people want to see more from me, I would absolutely be happy to deep dive into all the info we learned about it leading up to release, as I am super excited for this one. With all that said, though, my name has been Tom, otherwise known as Titanium Legman. I hope you all have a good night. Stay safe and healthy out there. And remember, be good to each other. Bye now.